viewing any videos in this series is strictly voluntary. Welcome back. We are continuing with this series on foundations of Christian marriage. You may have noticed that we are now in a 200 series and we had a 100 series before. If this were a college course, which it's not, the higher enumeration of the videos would indicate that we're getting more advanced or maybe more specific. And that's not primarily what I want to indicate. In fact, it's not at all what I want to communicate. The 100 series was on the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments, and that is about our relationship with God. The 200 series is on the last six of the, of the Ten Commandments on our relationships with each other, but that's built on or foundational, uh, built on the foundation of the first four, the relationship with God himself. God willing, we'll get to a 300 series, which is more specific, indeed, to Christian marriage on the subjects of structure and communications and uh, sexuality and finances and maybe some others. And then we'll wrap up with a series on parenting, a 400 series, which is really basically discipleship. And I hope that you'll hang in there with us. Hope you're finding these helpful. Let's go ahead and get started uh, where we left off in the Ten Commandments. The focus of today's command uh, thou shalt not steal is somewhat related to thou shalt not murder. Murder is focused uh, on the value of the person, or I should say valuing their life is focused on the, um, the truth that they are inherently in the image of God. Thou shalt not steal, or the positive flip side of that, which is to work diligently to bear fruit with whatever God has given you, and we'll go into detail on that in a minute, that's more focused on the how uh, to take care of the person. And we'll get to um, the specifics of that in just a moment. Before I forget, though, let me point you to Ephesians, I think it's chapter 4, verse 28, that says, uh, Paul there says, not to steal, but to work diligently with, diligent with our hands so that we can provide uh, for others who are in need. So that's very similar to what we covered uh, in a previous video we're going to focus more on the hows and the whys of that here. Now, I just mentioned that a positive uh, paraphrase of this is to work diligently to bear fruit with whatever God has given. Let me cover that in some detail before we go on. Uh, the primary metaphor of working in God's image in the Bible is bearing fruit. The world is pictured as um, formless, void, and dark in the beginning, Formless, meaning no potential, no order, and void of fruit. Void of seed-bearing plants, void of people who bear fruit, meaning they multiply, they reproduce God's image of his character in the world. And we are to not just be farmers, but to reproduce his image, to bear fruit, to, to be productive for his honor. And so that is the type of work that we are to do but to do it with whatever God provides us. He doesn't provide for everybody equally. He doesn't give us all the same skills. We're told in, in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Peter 4 and others, other passages that he gives us different uh, skill sets, different spiritual gifts, different abilities. He gives us different um, places in life. He has some that are born in certain places and some that are born in other places in different times. Uh, he gives us different physical abilities uh, all different types of gifts that he gives that very much influence what we can reproduce and to what level. Uh, we're told in one of the parables that God gave uh, one person a single talent, not a talent in terms of a skill, but that's a denomination of money, and another uh, two or five and, and ten, I forget the exact uh, number of talents there, and they were held responsible to reproduce them but they were held responsible individually according to what they had been given. And uh, God says elsewhere, to whom much has been given, much will be expected. So the Lord doesn't uh, compare us to each other. He only compares us to what he has given us to reproduce. And we're told that elsewhere in Scripture as well. well let's go ahead and get started and look at some specific applications to Christian marriage, because marriage is a lot of work, right? We we don't just have jobs to bring an in income. There's work on the relationship. There's work in parenting. There's work in relationships with other marriages that might mentor us or that we might mentor them. It's a lot of work. So what are the, some of the things that are implied here in this command? First, 
that God created us in his image, which involves bearing fruit. I've already alluded to uh, Genesis 1, but you might look at the, the John 15 verse there that's all about Jesus describing himself as the vine and us as the branches. And he says, this is to uh, glorify the Father that you bear much fruit in me. Again, that metaphor of being productive, uh, just as uh, Christ is godly, that we who follow him and have his spirit uh, by the work of his grace, we are to be Christians or Christ-like, bearing the fruit uh, of his character and his similar work. That is also exemplified in marriage. Even though Christ never got married, he was a person of initiative. He was a person of commitment. He was a person... Uh, he is God of kindness. He is God of strength and, and, um, uh, and justice and communication uh, and many other things that we can live out and must live out in marriage. Secondly, God equips us for work that provides for us and others. He gives us things that we need in order to serve others in our life. I'd point you to the Second Thessalonians passage there to read about working for the blessing of others for his honor. Um, how has God equipped you to serve your spouse or your family? He's made some of you unusually wise in uh, communications. He's made some of you unusually diligent in uh, service. He's made some of you unusually experienced and skilled uh, with money or with um, uh, parenting or uh, any number of things, but he has given that in order for you to love others well for their blessing, uh, to meet their needs by the activity of work. He often has us work with believers for our fruit, we've already mentioned that, our unity and our joy. The Lord puts us uh, in with believers, not just in church on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock or Wednesday night or Bible study, but we are to seek out relationships with other believers to work with them. And work is not just uh, earning an income. It is seeing a need, um, uh, initiating, following through, using the tools that we have, our, our skills, our experience, and our resources to meet that need in ways that benefit others. And he puts us in relationships with believers to do that. But he also has us work with unbelievers for our purity. Take a look at the Colossians and the Peter passage there. Uh, possibly more often than not, we will work with unbelievers. Sometimes in our uh, relationships and family, sometimes in our jobs, certainly in our neighborhoods. Why do I say more often than not? Because the Lord says narrow is the, the way to life and few find it and broad is the path to, to destruction, and many are on that path. There are more people in the world that do not uh, love the Lord Jesus and rest in him and follow him than there are who do. So most of the time, we will work with people who uh, do not love the Lord. That's going to take more work on our part. It's going to take more um, uh, forgiveness, more commitment, more initiative, more self-control, more prayer, more change in our heart by God's grace. But that is often for our own purity. It's not because we've done something wrong. Look at the passages there, as I said, in Colossians 3 and, and Peter. Uh, it is for our growth and to show that he is doing a supernatural work in us to be a witness, both in deed and, as he makes opportunity, in word, to tell them that he is the one who's making those changes in us. And lastly, he will reward us eternally for our works. We see that in Matthew 25 and in the 1 Corinthians 3 passage. Uh, God will, will bless us now and in eternity for our work. Well, again, how does that apply to Christian marriage? We've already listed several ways, but let's take a, a look at our homework for this week. What are the specific needs around you that require your work? There are some things that only you as a husband can do for your wife or only you as a wife can do for your husband or only you as parents can do for your kids. What has the Lord uh, provided for you to do in work at your job? 
How's that going to affect your marriage and your kids in your neighborhood? Can you disciple uh, your spouse and your kids by bringing them alongside in some ministry of service to a neighbor, to somebody in your church that's in need? Well, if God intended work to be a blessing for us, why is it so difficult? Well, if you look back at Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve uh, chose independence of God, and we still choose independence of God without his initiating work of grace in our life, when they did that, he cursed the ground, not work itself, and the, the labor pains, but not children or having children. And he did that, uh, he imposed those difficulties on work, and that's why labor is called labor, it's work too, right? He did that for at least five reasons. One is to humble us, so that we would not think too highly of ourselves. That was Adam and Eve's initial problem, is they wanted to become like God in the sense of determining for themselves the difference between good and evil. That's Satan's uh, original temptation, it seems, from Scripture, and one of the things he tempts us with. Uh, at the Tower of Babel, we see that they wanted to make a name for themselves instead of uh, a name for God. So uh, the difficulty of work humbles us to realize that we need him, which leads to the second point, to prompt us to cry out to God. And you'll see throughout Scripture is times when people were overwhelmed by a task before them and they cried out to God. Third, that we would depend on the God. It's one, it's one thing to be uh, mentally or emotionally humble. It's another thing to cry out. But it's a completely different thing to continue to depend on him day to day like a child who enjoys holding the hand of their father because uh, he or she knows that regular need to trust and follow them because they are good and wise and strong. Fourthly, to bear the fruit that we need to bear. In John 15, we're told that we cannot bear fruit without abiding in the Lord. We are the branches and he is the vine and his father is the vine dresser and he wants us to bear fruit. But we can't do that if we think too highly of ourselves and we don't call on the Lord and we try to do it in our own strength. And lastly, uh, at least uh, fifthly anyway, that we would rejoice in the Lord, that we would see he indeed does work in us and through us and around us to bear fruit because of his grace, his uh, committed love because of his um, initiative through Christ, uh, because of his power and in his timing and, and many other wonderful ways. But we are to work through Jesus for Jesus, not just for the sake of a paycheck or being promoted in a, uh, another title of status uh, or being able to uh, buy more things or be impressive to uh, other generations or the people around us. We work so that we can delight in the Lord.